Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, while you were talking, I, I, everything you said in favour of the word individualist, I was applying my mind to the word voluntarist or voluntarist. Yeah. And um, I thought it stacked up pretty well, actually. Yeah. Uh, it didn't have the negatives of the connotation of, of being selfish and uh, anti community. Um, and also, um, I think when you said that people might not self identify as collectivists, but they might self identify as communityists or communitarians. Yeah, communitarian is a kind of common word these days. And that's quite fluffy and nice for, for people, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and, and then the other thing, of course, is that um, one of the great virtues you said of, of the word in individualist is that it allows you to emphasize the voluntary principle. I thought, well, voluntariness or voluntarism allows you to do it even more directly. And, um, it's clear that, that um, and also we wouldn't expect to find them self-identifying as coercionists. Right, this is true. Um, so why not, uh, why not voluntarism? Why not voluntarism? Um, I think if the word was more commonly known, I would favour that. And less ugly. Yes, I mean, one thing is, it's not, it doesn't have the right snap. But also, I mean, the thing is this, um, the word individualism is, is still quite widely known, so it's a common past public discourse. The word voluntarist is not. Um, you mean, even if people have the wrong idea of what individualism means, you don't have to explain what the word is. They, have an, they already have a kind of notion in their mind. The word's widely known. If you use the word voluntarist to most people, their initial reaction is not to say, oh, that's a bad idea, it's to say, well, what the hell is that? Now, you may argue that in itself is an opportunity um, because it means you've got to, you can then explain what the word is. But I think actually that's a very significant handicap. And were it not for that, I think I would probably agree with you. Adopted, but I think the problem we face is that that's a word that is simply not around very much in public discourse, and that's a huge problem. You know, there have been successful attempts to take completely made up words or words that almost nobody knows and get them into major public discourse, but this is much more difficult than you might imagine. So, I uh, know that that's my short answer. I, I would, if I had my druthers, if I thought it was possible, I would agree with you, and I would take that because it has all the benefits you mentioned. Unfortunately, I think if you're fighting an uphill battle because of the simple incomprehension that you would face, as opposed to hostility. Can I ask about the, 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 the phrase individualism? I mean, you mentioned very briefly, I know, in the popularity of yeah. a certain nation. I think amongst people that are familiar with libertarianism or classical liberalism, it, uh, Rand's name is very much associated with individualism, things like the New Individualist Review and you know, her books, the, you know, glorifying the individual. Mm. You know, I think that in cultures where, you know, particularly in the United States, where she's well known, it is prone to say, oh, you are an individualist, therefore you believe in, you, you know, you are I'm right, you're a big business, and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? Well, yes, that, that, that is an interesting question. It might well be in the United States that the problem is people will think you're a randy. Mm. Um, we're, we're an objectivist, which for many people it is seriously off-putting. Um, I think the, the reason for, well, let me put it this way, most, I mean, I know one of many people who like, came to this position through reading her. Uh, but I think what most people do is they read her and then, to some degree, they get over her. Starting uh, with I, I think the, you know, <laughs> there's more to it than just that. Um, so, because, you know, there's a lot of what she has to say is extremely good. It's just the, the sort of the stuff that comes with it. Uh, not least, which is actually not so much ideas as a particular style. Uh, I think the, the reason why that's a problem is because, simply, she is the only major or popular intellectual figure who is self-identified as an individualist. That's the thing. So that label tends to be associated with her. What we need is for more philosophers, if you like, or political writers and thinkers to use the label themselves. So, for example, if Jan Narvison had called his book uh, you know, The Idea of Individualism rather than The Libertarian Idea, uh, there wouldn't be the straightforward association of um, individualism with, with Rand and the objectivist movement that you get. So, I mean, I think in a way, I think the, what the problem you identify as a real one in the United States is not over here. My experience is that most British people have no idea who she is. Uh, but it, it's something which I think can be uh, corrected quite easily. It's just a matter of, at the moment, she's the only person most people know of as a self defined individualist. Yeah. It's been my experience, actually, that uh, even though she rejected. The, the label libertarian itself, that very often the only popular person that people will have heard of that they identify even with the libertarian position is Anne Rand 
Yeah, this is true. Um, and I've, I've seen that over here, admittedly, my, my experience is a bit confined as Oxford and Edinburgh, but, but even so, that's, that's very widespread. And it's remarkable the number of people who've actually read Anne Rand, regardless of what the politics are, they've just read the books as novels at some point. Yes, this is true. I mean, there's an amazing reach. I mean, The Fountainhead has sold, was it, six million copies uh, so far? Um, and, you know, and, and no doubt counting. So that's a remarkable kind of reach by anybody's uh, imagination. The other, the other one they've tended to read is uh, The Moon's a Harsh Mistress. Yes, that's true. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, there are quite a number of science fiction works that um, are associated with that. That's actually one of the sort of like, areas of fiction where these. That label is still quite commonly used, actually. Yes. But, uh, sorry, just to come back to the original point, if, if you mentioned at the beginning of the talk about how in Europe liberalism <coughs> still tends to convey to a certain, you know, there's Arcosi would use it to criticise in Anglo Saxon Yes, that's right. Yes. So, what well, why, why, I mean, Anthony Jason has a piece where he says, he, I want you classical liberalism and libertarianism for precisely the reasons you gave, but he says, so we ought to revert to liberalism, you know, we ought to be unapologetic. Um, uh, I'm to, you know, we, we I, I yes. want my bloody word back. <laughs> I, know, <laughs> Again, I wish this was true, but I just think that um, the, the odds are simply overwhelmingly against us, I'm afraid. Um, you, you might just win that battle in, uh, say, the UK or in Australia. Um, you certainly wouldn't in either Canada or the United States, and I, I actually think you probably wouldn't in the UK. Well, that's presumably in, in Canada. I mean, you've got a case where you have a liberal party that's Swedish, so Democrat, you have a conservative party, but you've really, you know, completely free market. Um, well, in Australia, you've got a liberal party, party that's, a, which is that's conservative. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's a complete, it's a complete, it's, it's a complete, it's a complete mess. The, the problem is, I think that the once that kind of um, Transfer of the commonly understood meaning of a word has taken place. It's extremely hard to reverse it. Uh, that's the difficulty, I think. Um, in, in the UK, the term liberal is still you know, contested, if you will. So, you know, people will tend to put qualifiers in front of it. But even here, uh, the, there is a general and increasing sort of understanding which is in line with the American one. One of the problems we have is in the modern world is the uh, fact that, although this may be changing, so I'll, I'll put that coming in, we have an enormously powerful and intrusive mass media, which is dominated by a very particular and distinctive social formation. Uh, people who work in the mass media, mass circulation press, radio and television in particular, tend to come from an enormous, an astoundingly narrow social background. Uh, and they're also often, very often, related to each other. That's why I actually <laughs> use quite consciously the term a media class, because it's not just a group of people who have a certain set of common economic and social positions, like working in a particular kind of industry, they're also genetically related to the other people who work in that industry to a remarkable degree. Uh, and you know, the number of people working for the BBC, for example, who have parents or aunts or uncles who work in the BBC is remarkable. The degree of nepotism is simply staggering, actually. Uh, and, and the, the thing is that, so There's something in that. And they can get to Auntie ABC in Australia, and, the, yeah. and, it's, and the problem well, it's not it's not as bad in Australia because the previous government, in the name of conservatism, had rather smashed it up. But yes, it's extremely powerful. What that means is that the to the degree that this kind of <coughs> media contract tends to shape public understandings of what certain words mean and so on. The views that that media class have are going to be enormously amplified and will tend to affect public discourse to a great degree. Uh, other kinds of understandings or ways, um, ways of thinking about issues tend to be relegated to the margins as the kind of stuff that you talk about in the pub uh, and they don't have a kind of significant social standing. Uh, they, they're relegated to what the sociologists call the cultic media, the kind of underworld of cranky or fringe ideas. <laughs> Um, and now this may be changing, as I sort of intimated a couple of minutes ago, because it could well be that the new media and things are growing at the moment are undermining the kind of hegemonic position of this media class, which grew up in the central decades of the 20th century, but it's still very much powerful. And that means if they have a particular understanding of what the word liberal means, it's going to be very, very difficult to shift it, because that particular definition of meaning will be constantly reinforced by the way it's used, not deliberately, but just casually, in the media and in reportage of politics and the like. Uh, so, I, you know, again, I think you're right, we do like to do this, but uh, you're fighting an uphill battle. Uh, now, on the continent, it is quite different. In 
the German-speaking countries in Frankfurt. Countries. Everyone, knows, the word liberal is understood to mean you know, broadly what it meant in the 19th century, with a number of other meanings it doesn't have in the Anglo-Saxon world, by the way. If you say you're liberal also in the continent, they, you're typically understood to mean that you're anti-clerical mm. and yeah, hostile, and yeah, hostile yeah, to yeah. organised religion, particularly the Catholic Church. It has a whole, but again, for historical reasons, that's what 19th century continental liberal also means. Also, in Italy as well, it's associated with um, progressive sexual views. For use, yes. Yeah. As also it is in France, in fact. So, it has a whole, you know, <coughs> this is one of those interesting cases where there's a quite clear division between the Anglo-Saxon world on the one hand uh, and the continental European on the other. Yeah. I just wondered what you thought about the term neoliberal. That's a, now, that's an example of a, a term that's pejorative. Right. Um, uh, I mean, not necessarily. In theory, it should be just a kind of neutral description. Um, but in fact, it's a pejorative word because it's produced by critics of the position that they're describing. So whenever you find it used in the text, uh, it's a kind of mark of flag to tell you that the person in question has a particular uh, position and is hostile to the views that they're describing in this way. Yeah, I mean, no, 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 it's also a distorted view. I mean, what it, what it basically means is it's a way of describing uh, Neoliberalism that's used in the literature on, say, globalisation or other things, actually means um, essentially the policies of the uh, mainstream political elite in the United States. It means a kind of corporatist uh, market system in which the government is giving all kinds of goodies and favours to large corporate interests of one kind or another, uh, and but associated with also a particular foreign policy. It, it's actually much more accurately, it is what basically describes the positions and policies of the group one time self-described neoconservatives, you know, the, the weekly standard people and people that's all. And uh, Crystal is happy to go with it. Yes. I mean, uh, I suppose relating to neoliberal, it's another thing that comes up constantly in the literature. I'm just wondering if you might have any ideas where it emerged, but this concept of late capitalism. Oh, well, I know where that comes from. Um, late cap that, that comes, well, it has two origins, interestingly. One of them, it comes from a book called Late Capitalism by a guy called Ernest Mandel. Um, who's a Belgian uh, trot um, in the 1950s, well, he actually died quite recently, but he wrote the book in the late 1960s, early 70s, and it was brought out in a significant revised edition in the early 80s. Uh, and it, it's the, that's the sort of source. Most of the people who use the term are drawing on Mandel's um, uh, you know, analysis in that book. So it's a kind of fourth internationalist, Trotskyist uh, uh, term. Uh, it also comes partly from Barons and Sweezy's uh, book, which what, has a different title, but which again was fourth internationalist thinking in the United States in the 60s. The other source for the idea, though, um, actually is a rather strange one, which many people I think are, who use it are not aware of, and that's a German guy called Werner Sombart. Um, Sombart is one of the great economic historians, but he's under a significant cloud these days because he was a Nazi. Um, and he actually is the man who propagates the word capitalism. Marx always never uses it, interestingly. Um, he talks about capital, he talks about the bourgeoisie, but he doesn't talk about capitalism. He only ever uses the word twice, right at the end of his life in private correspondence. It's Sombart who actually uh, makes the term capitalism widespread. When he brings out this enormous book um, in four different editions between 1895 1920 called De Moderna Capitalismus, never been translated into English, which in many ways is a great shame. And Sombart argues that capitalism is uh, something which has gone through a series of changes, and this is linked to Hegelian philosophy, so these changes are meant to show the kind of gradual unfolding of the real, the geist uh, of this form of social organisation. So you have mercantile capitalism, industrial capitalism, finance capitalism, and then he says, we are in the future, we are going to have late capitalism. So, Sombart is the other source, in fact, that's where Mandel got the word from. So that's where that category comes from. What does it mean? It means a form, uh, uh, he, he thinks that capitalism has certain kind of uh, qualities that mean it's ultimately not sustainable. So, late like capitalism... Like Schumpeter's argument that eventually capitalism would produce a type of socialism. Partly, except that in his case he thinks it will produce fascism, basically. Um, one of the things he thinks it tends to do is to undermine racial purity and collective ethnic solidarity. One of Solbach's main notions is that the Jews are the key group in capitalism. Uh, he wrote a book which is still in print called The Jews and Modern Capitalism. And he says, well, he's a friend of Weber's, and he says, well, Weber's got it wrong. Um, the people who are responsible for creating capitalism are not um, Calvinists. It's, it's Jews who do it. Uh, and he also thinks...
thinks it's due to women. And he has a strange argument that the reason why uh, markets and mercantile trade really originates is because of the demand of women for lots of fripperies and... <laughs> and uh, so he argues that what you have in the Middle Ages are lots of um, uh, hairy warriors who really only just want to drink and kill people, but their women folk want more than this. They want toiletries and baths and fine clothes and jewellery and this kind of thing. And so the Jews then come along and they say, oh, well, again, we'll supply you with all these things, and that's how the market economy appears. That's not too much of a caricature. Um, so Sombart is actually an amazingly influential figure intellectually, but he's also, most of the people who actually are drawing upon his ideas and articulate them don't realise that that's where they come from. S-O-M-B-A-R-T. S-O-M-B-A-R-T, yeah. He's, uh, the bulk of his work is not <coughs> translated, but you know, a fair bit of it has. Um, well, it's just great, Tom, uh, warning, supposedly, Warning the undergraduates, you know, or the graduates as well, to come back into the, into, into the central part of Oxford, or otherwise the townies will beat the shit out of them. Yeah, it's absolutely. a relic of St. Scholastica's day, that's <laughs> in 13, whenever. Yes. <laughs> Charles now, not townies. Charles now, not townies. Yes, well, I mean, yeah. townies is a little more polite. I mean, Chad's is sort of. <laughs> yes. Um, somewhat non you. <laughs> It'll ring 101 times. If, if, if you were to read the obituary of somebody who's described as an individualist, yes. I think your, your immediate conclusion would be that they were an eccentric or uh, crank. Or yes. You, you, Unfortunately. Insofar as you said, you said that the problem with the word voluntarism is that <clears throat> it doesn't have a common understanding. Mm. Uh, and yeah, the word individualism does have a common understanding, but it either means selfish or it means crank. <laughs> you know, it, it, it doesn't have the positive connotation that we might like to, you know, we, we, we might... I don't think like it is, maybe, maybe this is a different evaluation, I don't think that second connotation you mentioned of, well, eccentric, is actually a negative one. Not in Britain. Not in Britain, anyway. Um, it may well be in, oh, okay, let me sort of, sort of bring up um, Rand again. One of the countries where Rand is extremely unsuccessful is Germany. The Germans just have great trouble. I don't why anyone likes this, this stuff. And one of the reasons is that's a, that's a culture where eccentricity, there are eccentricities obviously, but eccentricity is regarded as disreputable. I think in the UK, in, in Britain, and to a great degree in many of the Anglophone countries, eccentricity is regarded as not exactly admirable, but a good thing. Because it means that you're standing out. You are not just going along with the herd. Uh, you're unconventional. This is, these are all things which are given a kind of positive social connotation. The only place where the only Anglophone country where that's maybe is Australia, actually. Yeah, because you're not part of the, not, not a, a mate. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, but yes, that's the. Um, uh, so I think actually that, that is a positive connotation rather than a negative one. And also, I mean, to be a bit sort of grouchkin about this, um, it's a positive connotation for a particularly influential <coughs> social group which is the group of what you might call artists and uh, propagators of ideas. Uh, one of the, I mean, a completely different lecture this, but just to give you a quick thing about it, one of the interesting questions is why does classical liberalism, um, to use that terminology, lose its grip on culture and art in the late 19th century? Most of the, a lot of the great composers, writers, artists of the early to mid 19th century are staunch liberals, Beethoven, for example, Verdi, uh, Stondahl, Thackeray, people like that, they're all ardent liberals. By the time you get to the 1890s, you get people like Flaubert, who are violently anti-liberal. I mean, Flaubert, one of Flaubert's big things is to attack liberalism. That's one of his big bugbears in all his works. Why? Well, one of the reasons is, that in the late 19th century, a lot of artists come to the belief or notion that um, Liberalism is associated with a kind of stultifying conformist bourgeois culture, which they dislike intensely, which they see themselves as reacting against. Uh, and so, in fact, and they, people like that are enormously influential. The effect that uh, people like writers and artists have upon cultural attitudes and expectations and ways of thinking is immense. Uh, and people like that are likely to be receptive to that notion of individualist because they, they like that body of association. Described. Uh, and that's actually again one of the benefits it brings, I think. Because that's, that's definitely a kind of rupture that you, you need to look to repair in Europe. 
But, but, but if you try to be that, if, like, <laughs> you, you've almost made a good point against individualism there, I think, which is that much like the word conservatism now means anything from somebody who hates immigrants and hates gays to somebody who, you know, is completely free market and everything. Mm -hmm. So if individualism can be adopted by anybody, you know, who, as a, a set of um, uh, living principles rather than political beliefs, then it's hopeless oh, as, a, no. as, a, as a political label. It's no, not at all. That was the point about my kind of an analytical item at the start. My point is that to the extent that labels or words have a kind of commonly understood meaning in terms of a set of beliefs or attitudes or outlooks, if you allow that label to be put upon yourself, you will tend to find that you yourself will adopt some of those other views. That's the extraordinary kind of effect of the power of words. So conservatism is a classic case in point, it seems to me. Um, conservatism, as it's commonly understood today in Anglo-Saxon means this, I think, very unstable combination of free market economics and social and cultural conservatism. Now, what happens is, if you self-identify as a conservative, you think, that's the label I'm going to stick on, basically, <coughs> what will tend to happen, almost like against your will and unconsciously, is that even if you enter that, adopting that label, initially as someone who is both pro-market but also socially liberal, or libertarian, as you might say, you will tend to find that you are going to vote for candidates who are, you know, an approve of political candidates who are socially illiberal, and your own views will tend to shift in that direction. The words that you use to define people's views often have a great effect in actually, you know, making them think, oh, well, I really ought to believe in this, or to think that they're more, they should actually drive them to a particular direction. I say words are powerful. So it isn't the case that the word is a kind of Humpty Dumpty thing, which can mean anything, since I have to drop that solution instantly. How much of that effect do you think is due to sort of once you're identified as a conservative, you're on a team and the other team has these views? Well, yeah, but, well the point is also, to the, it's partly a case of uh, you're on the team, you tend to conform with the people you're on the team with, so to speak. Mm. Um, and also, it's simply a matter of like mixing with people who have that particular combination of views will tend to influence, and influence you. People do tend to like, you know, go along with what people are with uh, think. But also, it's a question of you will actually, in many ways, tend to adopt the position that other people have of you. It's remarkable how much uh, people will actually adopt the behaviour, the beliefs, the attitudes that other people, including people who are in fact particularly people maybe who are hostile to them, have of them. And so, if the way in which the views are articulated, unless you make a conscious effort in many cases, now that's why, you know, a label which is incoherent or which has some kind of other connotations or freight attached to it can actually be, you know, powerful in a bad way because of this sociological phenomenon, I think. So in that case, do you mean that libertarians or individualists need some kind of coherent organisation that's separate from the Conservative Party? Or that's a different question. I would, tend to, I would tend to say yes, but not necessarily a political movement. Um, because uh, well, like a ginger group. Well, no, I wouldn't even do that. I wouldn't even do that. We wouldn't seek to do that. Um, if you look at the historical origins of both, you know, historical conservatism, historical liberalism, or indeed the Labour Party and uh, Labour politics in the UK, and this is true also in other parts of the world, they don't actually typically start off as a political party. What you have instead is a kind of broader social movement of institutions which are. Uh, very often things like leisure clubs, one kind of other. The political party is the last kind of thing, it's the epiphenomenon that grows out of these other uh, social organisations. The obvious case is the Labour Party, where you have trades unions and things of that sort, which then, after being in existence for nearly 100 years, finally produce a political party. But the same thing is true for the Liberal Party. One of the reasons why the Liberal Party actually collapses in the first part of the 20th century, apart from you know all the tergiversation between Lloyd George and Asquith and so on, is because that substructure, liberal England, if you will, just disappears quite suddenly and abruptly between about 1910 and 1930. And uh, I think what that means is that to the extent that there is a kind of social movement, the thing to do is to have organisations, um, institutions, if you will, which create a kind of self-aware self uh, position or identity. But I don't think that needs 
it's been to be either like a pressure group or much less a political party. I think in the fullness of time that kind of thing might lead to a political party. Uh, but I don't, you know, starting off with setting up a political party is really a classic case, I think, of getting the cart before the horse, you know, doing it back to front. So could you sketch out then what kind of organisations in civil society do you think will proceed? Well, um, histor respect? historically, there were just things like leisure clubs, well, things like this organisation, and discussion clubs, um, reading clubs, social organisations, things where people just met together to have a good time. I mean, you know, there used to be a time when uh, there were lots and lots of uh, you know, private, you know, clubs of one kind of other people just go to. This was, of course, in the days before television. You know. One of the things is, of course, maybe the kind of social organisations that existed in the, in the past uh, would not have been practical because uh, time is much more valuable today for various reasons. Uh, and people, you know, we live in a world where television has come to dominate uh, leisure activity. So people don't think that the way to understand yourself is to go to a, a reading group or something where they may have done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, what I'm saying. That's what I would say. Maybe the future is things like social networking, uh, and science, various kinds, that kind of thing. Well, I, I think on that note, perhaps we might uh, bring the uh, formal proceedings of this uh, of uh, this evening to a to a close. If, if you'd all like to thank uh, Stephen Davis for, um, for his brief speech.